14º Congresso Internacional de Jornalismo Investigativo da Abrage. Se vocês quiserem fazer perguntas para o Adam, depois que ele terminar a apresentação dele, vocês terão que usar este maldito instrumento aqui. Ordens do Bramate, reclamações com ele também. Tá? É, vocês têm que entrar no aplicativo, no Attendify, daí aqui no aplicativo tem quem está aqui, daí vocês têm que procurar pelo meu nome, daí vocês precisam saber, José Alberto Toledo, e daí vocês me mandam uma mensagem privada com a sua pergunta. Só perguntas, por favor. É, xingamentos depois. É, isso é o que vocês precisam saber. Eu só vou apresentar muito rapidamente o Adam, depois a gente vai conversar um pouco mais sobre a carreira dele, o que ele tem feito, exatamente o que ele faz no New York Times. Mas, por enquanto, a única coisa que vocês precisam saber sobre o Adam é que ele é diretor e produtor executivo de uh, vários filmes jornalísticos, documentários jornalísticos, mini-docs, como os entendidos falam por aqui no Brasil em português, mini-doc, é, que foram muito, receberam muitos prêmios, inclusive Pulitzer e o Emmy, que são talvez os principais é, prêmios nos Estados Unidos para essa área. Mas, na minha opinião, o que mais distingue o Adam de nós, como uns mortais, é que ele é capaz de fazer filmes de jornalismo investigativo que não são chatos, como vocês vão poder ver. So, Adam, let's play. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, it is. I thought when we were starting at nine, that would mean one o'clock. So we're very early today. Um, I think this is my eighth trip to Brazil. One of my favorite countries. I've had the honor of traveling all around the country to Roraima and Santa Carina and in many places in the interior and Amazonas. And um, I'm studying some Portuguese, but today I'm going to speak in English because my Portuguese is limited to three very important phrases. Bogia, Jabuticaba, <laughs> and Credito or Debito. So today I'm going to tell you about a one and a half year story of my life that started as a kind of personal curiosity and ended up in a professional pursuit. Um, and I'll try to do it in about 30 minutes. Um, this is the story of Operation Infection. It's a three part video series and it is now in Portuguese on YouTube. So if you search it for YouTube, it's a single documentary that's 47 minutes. Um, and you can change the subtitles and see it in Portuguese. Um, so the story basically is a five decade story through the history of disinformation. And it looks at the tactics and methods of creating and spreading disinformation during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, and the film has three main attributes. It has original explanatory slash investigative reporting. It has animate, uh, lively animation. And it also has archival video. So these three elements are combined to create this film. But in the end of the day, the film is basically about one thing. It's a film about bullshit. Now you might think it's odd that we use this word in the film, and many people have commented, why is the New York Times making a film and using the word bullshit? But it's actually not funny, but it's our attempt to use language and script writing in a way that can make a very serious subject accessible to ordinary people. Because when people are at a bar talking about this issue, they don't discuss an effective and successful disinformation campaign, they discuss bullshit. So we're trying to use ordinary language in this film. So um, I'm going to show you uh, a bunch of clips from the film. We're not going to screen the whole thing. Uh, it begins in 1959. 
And it basically explains the simple fact that the Soviet Union launched dozens of highly successful disinformation operations with the single goal of creating chaos in the West with the single goal to destroy international alliances. And if you think about it, if Russia or then the Soviet Union is clashing with the United States, EU and NATO, they are at a disadvantage. But when these alliances are broken up, Russia can bully countries one-on-one -on -one, like it's doing right now in the Baltic states. So here is a short clip of the beginning of the film to give you a flavor. The thing about a virus is it doesn't destroy you head on. Instead, it brings you down from the inside, turning your own cells into enemies. This story is about a virus, a virus created five decades ago by a government to slowly and methodically poison its enemies. But it's not a biological virus, it's uh, more like a political one. And chances are, you've already been infected. And yes, it's also a story about this guy, and a term he likes to think he invented. Really, the word, I, I think one of the greatest of all terms I've, I've come up with is fake. I guess other people have used it perhaps over the years, but I've never noticed it. It's only been around for a few years, but you're probably as sick of it as we are. Well, the thing is, it's actually really old. It's just that once, it went by a very different name. If you feel like you don't know who to trust anymore, this might be the thing that's making you feel that way. If you feel exhausted by the news, this could be why. And if you're sick of it all and you just want to stop caring, then we really need to talk. Ready? So our goal here is to heighten the audience's uh, radar to detect disinformation, and we were hoping to reach policymakers, technologists, security analysts, and of course, as I mentioned, ordinary people. So people often ask me, how did you even come up with this idea? Uh, what, what is the genesis of the story? And as you're taught in journalism school, you have to have great sources, and a very high profile, very important person gave me this document almost two years ago and said I should read it. That person is Claire Wardle, who's sitting right here. So one of the lessons is that you have to know very important people or you just have to know Claire. <laughs> this is a 100-page document. It was written in 1986 by the US government. Most journalists will agree that when you're given a state document from 30 plus years ago, it's normally boring and stale and irrelevant and not very useful. And when I read this document, I got goosebumps on my arms because it read like a captivating or riveting movie script. It documented a cat and mouse game between the US and the Soviet Union. And it described dozens of campaigns that the Soviet Union launched uh, creating disinformation about the US. One of those campaigns actually takes place here in South America. Uh, it's a conspiracy that rich Americans were adopting babies from South America and selling their organs in order to enrich their personal finances. And this was spread in newspapers and on TV stations all across South America and is still believed by some people today uh, because a good disinformation campaign is, is never fully silenced. So I was reading this report and everything felt so relevant today, every line of this report, and it described the tactics and methods and techniques of creating disinformation and disseminating it in a pre-internet world. So I thought this could be a super interesting story, and I wasn't sure yet if it would be a newspaper story or a documentary or a podcast, but the reporting was super interesting. And then I started reading the news, continuing to read the news every day, and I kept thinking of this report, and every story I read made me return to this report. 
So then I started looking at who wrote this report, and I tried to find more reports that were written by the same people. And I found about five or six more reports between 1983 and 1991, hundreds and hundreds of pages documenting the Soviet campaign against the United States. By the way, these campaigns were launched in countries where the US had military bases, so they were highly strategic and targeted. For example, in the Philippines and Japan, where the US had military bases, they would launch a disinformation campaign, and the hope was to turn the local population against the US military. So at the end of the report, oh, by the way, this is one of the very eerie, relevant things. Uh, they, all of the reports, maybe we can um, dim the lights a little bit, if possible. Um, this rep the reports, um, the reports documented uh, very deliberate campaigns against the media, against the free press, against the Western press, which is obviously something very relevant today. There were uh, many, many pages showing articles saying, never believe anything you read in the press. So I want to read to you um, one quote that is from 1986. And this is one of the quotes I read that I couldn't help but thinking of the news today. It's about Moscow's disinformation campaign in the mid-1980s. The trend can be expected to continue. The top personnel are well-versed in Western culture and Western society. Their understanding will certainly enhance the Soviet capability to influence Western audiences. The most important reason that these measures can be expected to continue is the fact that they are successful. So, the report at the end included a whole bunch of sources. And there were two sides to this cat and mouse game. This right here uh, are all of the US government officials on a very small team called the Active Measures Working Group. And they were an interagency group appointed by President Ronald Reagan to fight disinformation. And of course, they did this before the internet, so they literally had a board up with articles that the embassies would send them from all around the world. And when they received them, they would tack them up against a map, a world map, and they would try to draw connections. Why is this article appearing in Africa when this article appeared in Argentina, and here's one in Japan? And they would connect the dots. So as a journalist, to me, this was a reporter's dream. It was all of these names of people who were in this disinformation business decades ago. And then they listed all of, not all, but many of the names of senior leaders in the Russian military unit, the GRU, military intelligence, and the KGB. So all of a sudden, I had what every journalist dreams of. I had hundreds of names of people who are on the forefront of a story that is a massive, important generational story of today. And I went to find them. And I started making tons of phone calls. And I found, um, I found some emails. And I found some uh, Facebook accounts. And I kept running into the same problem over and over and over again. Everyone was dead. I found one guy who was alive, and I called him, and he answered the phone, but it was very sad. He had dementia, and he wasn't able to answer any of my questions. For several weeks, my computer was basically uh, a live obituary site. I think we found dozens of dozens of obituaries of people, um, and many of them had just died in the past five years. Here is a little clip of uh, some of the old videos that we found. But first, let me introduce you to a few authentic grifters. Stashed away on some old videotapes, we found interviews with a bunch of ex-spies. This guy, Ladislav Bittman, this guy, Stanislav Levchenko, and this guy, Yuri Bezminov. They all worked for the KGB during the Cold War before defecting to the US. And it's thanks to them that we know so much about one of the KGB's most secretive departments. Only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process, which we call either ideological subversion 
or active measures, активные мероприятия in the language of the KGB. So active measures, it's a euphemism for, well, bullshit. But not just any bullshit, the most strategic, masterful, toxic bullshit you could possibly imagine. Made with one goal. To change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. Within the KGB is a department that specializes in planting false stories and forged documents. We know it was run from Department A, right at the top of the KGB, and it had a multi-million dollar budget. At least 15,000 people who, in the Soviet Union and outside of the Soviet Union, are involved in that kind of actions on regular and daily basis. You heard that right, 15,000 people. That's more than the entire staff at the State Department after 9-11. So you can see here, when you can't find people who are alive, you can tap into a whole bunch of sources, and some of these guys, all of these guys that you see here uh, are dead, but to me they were like living characters on the depths of libraries and YouTube and other places and um, they're really fascinating interviews that were done with them in the 1980s. So because we couldn't find anyone alive, we went on this intense research expedition. And in the end, we found 235 research items, photos, radio reports, newspaper clippings from several dozen countries, including Brazil, videos from the Cold War. We went to the Library of Congress and found dozens of international press clippings. We went to presidential libraries. We found Stasi-funded German t uh, TV films from the 1980s. We used French and Swedish documentary footage from the 70s and 80s. And all of this led to one of the most fascinating clips we found, which was a news report in the mid-1980s with Dan Rather, who was one of the most famous TV anchors of my generation. This is national TV news in the United States, and he's reading a fake news story disseminated by the Soviet Union that the U.S. created the AIDS virus as a way to kill blacks and gays. It's a so-called ethnic or biological, uh, biological ethnic weapon. Um, so we found all of these clips, and we, were, uh, we, we then decided that this project should be a video project uh, because it was sort of a living history. Um, so eventually, I never give up, and I tried to find someone who was alive, and I found these two people. This woman on the right is named Kathleen Bailey, and that's her in the mid-1980s at a press conference in front of about 10 people trying to explain to the media that the Russians, uh, Soviets, are launching a disinformation campaign. I eventually found her. The last job that she had before I found her retired is she was a lime farmer in the state of Hawaii. But in the mid-1980s, she had a different life. I found her living alone in Dallas, Texas. Well, not alone. She was living with her diabetic cat. And she said no journalist had reached out to her in, dozen, uh, de in decades. And she invited me to her home. And she was like, why do you want to talk to me? It's, I have no stories. I was just uh, studying disinformation and working to fight these lies. But it was before the internet. So I don't think I can be much value to you. And we went and interviewed her. And this gentleman is named Landislav Bittman. His name now is Larry Martin. He was a spy. He was a disinformation director who reported to Moscow in the 1960s. And I found him also living alone. I guess everyone who works in, in disinformation ends up living alone. Um, Claire, that's a... Uh, <laughs> he defected in the 1960s and ended up in uh, Massachusetts, 87 years old. I got his email address from a family member, and he said in the email, I am so honored and flattered that you have reached out to me. No one has called me about the issue I spent my life researching since the 1980s. I used to teach a disinformation class at a university in Boston in the 1990s. 
and they canceled it in 1992 when the Cold War ended because the university told me disinformation is no longer relevant. <laughs> so Larry can't hear, so he invited me to his house. I wasn't able to do a phone interview. Normally I'm not gonna drive seven hours to meet someone if I can't at least hear them on the phone, but in this case I knew I had to go. When I showed up in his house, um, he had my LinkedIn page printed out, 87 years old, had my LinkedIn page printed out on his desk and he had underlined certain parts of my career, so clearly he hadn't lost his touch. <laughs> Sadly, Larry died about three months after we interviewed him and one of the sad moments for me is that he kept emailing me wondering when the film was gonna come out and we were unable to broadcast, but his, um, his daughter uh, d was able to come to our premiere in New York City. So here's a little clip of Larry. Now these days, KGB defectors who are still breathing are a little hard to come by, but we tracked down one to a small town in Massachusetts. Well, my original name was Ladislav Bittman. These days, he goes by Larry Martin. He's 87 years old. It's a collage. Uh, he likes to paint. With Putin, and he was boasting about his riches. And of course, he has a girlfriend down in Florida. Hello, hello. I am still busy. I... But back in the day, he was a director at one of the most legendary active measures outposts reporting to Moscow. Yeah, and when it comes to bullshit, Larry's done it all. His first uh, ever con? was an operation to establish a whorehouse in Germany. That was to catch politicians in compromising situations. Uh, and once he even planted uh, a treasure chest of Nazi documents. papers at the bottom of a lake. Na original Nazi documents. That was to stir up anti-German sentiments. Larry's expertise, though, was a special kind of bullshit, something called... Disinformation. Basically, it means uh, <clears throat> deliberately distorted information that is secretly leaked into the communication process in, in order to deceive and manipulate. So that's Larry. And this led us to dissecting one of the many dozens of campaigns I read about in those reports, which is the AIDS case that I mentioned. So this is a case that was uh, launched by the Soviets in 1983. It, was, it took six years for them to complete this operation of disinformation. It reached 80 countries um, and it was highly sophisticated. We found a survey from 2005 that said that 30% of Americans still believe that AIDS was created. So uh, we also found references from Law and & Order and Kanye West songs and all sorts of popular culture references where this uh, disinformation campaign is still alive and well today in everything from music to TV to cinema. So I'm gonna show you a quick scene of how we told this story. All right, so let's go back to 1983, and we're going to show you what really happened here. So remember this story started with an article in the Patriot newspaper? AIDS, the deadly mysterious disease which has caused havoc in the U.S., is believed to be the result of the Pentagon's experiments to develop new and dangerous biological weapons. There's the crux of the crowd. It's time you met Kathleen Bailey and Todd Leventhal. They were part of a US government team that first pieced this story together back in the 80s. This is just the perfect example of a very effective disinformation campaign. Well, almost perfect. There are some obvious grammar mistakes here which tip off experts like Kathleen. Like in English, we'd say flu virus, not the virus flu. It's written by a non-native English speaker, and it probably was written by a Russian language speaker. They said, oh, the Indian newspaper, the Patriot, which we knew, the KGB used this as an English language newspaper, as a way to, um, to get stories out. This was a classic Soviet tactic. Oleg Kaluchins, another ex-KGB agent we found, he told us they'd always try and place the story in a third world country, somewhere like say in India, Thailand, where journalists could well, be easily tricked Japan, or bribed. That gave the story 
acceptability when um, nobody, uh, nobody was searching about the origin. The KGB let the story go quiet for a couple of years after India, but with AIDS still making scary headlines in 85, they revived it, this time in a prominent Moscow newspaper. And the source for this story? You guessed it. It's brilliant, really. They've repeated the story, but concealed their hand, distancing themselves from the lie they started. So we're now into 1986, and the KGB want to add gravitas to this lie. So they look around for a scientist, a human face, someone who could back up the lie with data. And, no joke, this is the dude they found. This is Dr. Jacob Segal. Remember I said the report had two authors? Well, here comes the co-author now. It's his wife, Lily. Believe it or not, these two wrote that report that claimed to have evidence AIDS was created in a US government lab. This scientific gobbledygook. And, you know, you read this stuff and who can understand it? But it purports to be proof. The thing is, it worked. The KGB made sure the Segal report was read by journalists all over Africa, and they kept on pushing it until it went, well, viral. It appeared in 200 reports in 80 countries. Even the Daily Express in London runs with it. And finally, on March 30th, 1987, the KGB hits the jackpot. A Soviet military publication claims, claims the, the virus, virus that causes, causes AIDS leaked. Leaked, leaked, leaked. This campaign had a KGB code name. They called it Operation Infection. Good afternoon. I would like to begin uh, the introduction to this report by stating that the U.S. image abroad is damaged and U.S. foreign policy is complicated by disinformation. Well, <laughs> that's a life, a half a lifetime ago. This was handed out at a demonstration. I was so angry that they accused the United States of creating the AIDS virus because I knew how effective that was going to be as a tool against us. And it angered me deeply. <laughs> and uh, it empowered me, it, it motivated me, it fired me up. Uh, I was pissed. So at this point, we had a lovely 14 minute historical film that we were very proud of. And it offered us a few lessons for us and our audience, which is oftentimes, especially in this wild political climate, everything feels new to us, especially to a younger generation of journalists. And it provided a lesson that what feels new to us is not necessarily new. The tactics and the techniques have, cha have not changed, but the technology has changed. And that history offers us journalists a gold mine of ideas and of lessons and digging into it can be a very valuable and precious experience. So we were ready to publish this historical film that we thought was more or less finished. And then, like journalists all over the world, we got scooped because the news moves faster than we do. And a gentleman by the name of Robert Mueller dropped an indictment right when we were thinking of publishing. And the indictment charged 12 Russians and three Russian businesses with meddling in the US presidential election with a very sophisticated disinformation campaign. The indictment is approximately 36 pages, I believe, and I'm embarrassed to tell you that when I read it, I got goosebumps again. You probably think I always get goosebumps, but I swear it was just these two times. Um, the indictment read exactly like the reports from the 1980s. In fact, both of them have sections that reference the spelling mistakes that led people to detect the origins of the disinformation, and the techniques are almost identical. Obviously, there are some differences, like an Indian newspaper versus Instagram, but the targets were the same, and the objectives were the same, and the stories all focused on uh, unbelievable, far-fetched ideas and focused on apocalyptic ideas and uh, they were all very successful and had impact in the real world from uh, having Americans protest against each other and uh, incentivizing people to vote, both uh, targeting the left and the right. So I felt that if we had just a historical film, we would be doing a disservice 
and that we needed to connect the dots for our audience from the past to the present. So we created episode two, which is a playbook. And basically we looked at all of these cases from the past and the present and we identified what I call the seven commandments of fake news. These are time-tested, sustainable, everlasting techniques that you can identify in almost every successful disinformation campaign. And we went, went around to every living expert we could find and former agent, and we asked them to describe these seven commandments. And here is a short scene of the playbook. With the help of our experts, not to mention our spies and our detectives, we've reverse engineered the seven commandments of Russian disinformation, a time-tested step-by-step recipe to creating the perfect fake news story. So rule number one, look for cracks in the target society, social divisions you can exploit and wedge open. They look for economic, social, demographic, linguistic, regional, ethnic, any sort of division. And how can we actually emphasize those divisions and actually make people lose trust in one another? So it's like being a doctor. You have to understand a patient. Oh, he's got a bad knee, he's got a sore hip, he's got a disease that causes weakness here. But instead of trying to make it better, we try to make everything worse. Rule two, create a big, bold lie, something so outrageous no one could possibly believe it was made up. Also so egregious that if they could get people to believe it, it would be totally damning. Rule number three, wrap that line around a kernel of truth. Propaganda is most effective when there's a little bit of truth in it. The most successful operations of that kind contain some truthful element so that uh, the disinformation is eventually accepted as a whole. Rule four, conceal your hands, making it seem like the story came from somewhere else. Nobody was searching about the origin, how it started, who published the story first. This was, of course, a method then repeated again and again. Rule number five, find yourself a useful idiot. Useful idiots are, are essentially people they would identify who unwittingly will take the Kremlin's message and push it into the target audience, the foreign population they want to reach. They were idiots in that they didn't see what was obvious, and they were very useful. And what happens when those pesky truth seekers try and debunk your fake story? Well, rule six, as you covered. Deny, deny, deny. Even if the truth is obvious, yeah, deny, deny, deny they will bluster their way out of things because they've realized that our attention span is quite short. And finally, and this is a really important one, play the long game. Russia's willing to play a long game, put long, large resources into things that may not bear fruit for many years to come. The, the accumulation of these operations over a long period of time will result in a major political impact. And if you think about it as a drip on a rock, today the drip doesn't have any impact. If that drip hits for a long period of time, years, there will be a hole in the rock. And they know that. These seven simple rules were a powerful weapon for the KGB, and they applied them again and again and again. But then something came along which changed the game entirely. So after the playbook, we wanted to apply the playbook to 2016 to 2018. So we looked at about 10 cases that uh, successful disinformation campaigns that happened in the past few years. And we literally had a spreadsheet with the seven rules and uh, about, a, I don't know, 10 or 12 cases uh, from around the world, from all different countries, from Germany, from Latin America, um, to Eastern Europe, and obviously in the States. And we ended up picking the Pizzagate case. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, it occurred in the lead up to our presidential election. It's a disinformation campaign that alleges that Hillary Clinton was running a sex pedophile ring in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, DC. 
And it actually led to someone who believed this and who went with a gun uh, and fired shots at the pizzeria who believed that the, um, that the story was real. And sometimes critics of disinformation or people who don't think it's so important will tell you it's impossible to measure. And this is a case where the influence like, led to real world impact. So I'm gonna skip over the clip, um, but we basically document all of the rules and apply it to this case so our audience can understand. Uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure we're not doing is like making the audience assume that they can connect the dots. We wanted to outlay, uh, lay out everything for them. So I'll show you a short clip of the end of episode two. This is a gentleman named Yuri Bezminov. He was a very famous disinformation agent. He, he's dead. Um, and this clip is from 1984. And if you just think of the words he's saying and think if someone said them in 2018, it would be equally relevant. Two insane lies, 30 years apart. One story took six years to take hold, the other barely six months. But they both share the same DNA, the same unmistakable trace of active measures and the same goal, to shift the world's balance of power by turning Western countries on themselves. We're at war and we've got absolutely no idea. Those were Russians. They were not Russians. I don't go with the Russians. And we're facing a sophisticated weapon designed to bring down democracies from the inside, just as the KGB envisioned all those years ago. Fighting war on a battlefield is the most stupid and primitive way of fighting a war. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in your enemy's country. Anything. Put white against black, old against young, uh, I don't know, wealth against poor and so on. Doesn't matter. As long as it disturbs society, as long as it cuts the moral fiber of a nation, it's good. The virus that causes AIDS leaked. With an assault rifle targeting a Washington, D.C. spot. And then you just take this country when everything is subverted, when the country is disoriented and confused, when it is demoralized and then destabilized. Then the crisis will come. So Yuri Bizminov is like, you know, perfect casting for a former spy, by the way. We got very lucky finding that old interview. So then we were ready to publish and we got scooped again because the story continued moving faster than we did. So we made uh, episode three, um, which basically the world was changing again. And at this point, when we were finished episode two, Mark Zuckerberg was testifying um, in Washington and also in London. And the Times was writing like a front page story almost every day or every week about social media regulation. And more evidence was leaking out about the disinformation efforts around our presidential campaign. And there was already an indictment, another indictment for Russian disinformation meddling in the midterm election. So you could see that the story was continuing. It wasn't just a blip. So we just thought it would be a disservice to have two episodes that highlight the problem and not make a third episode that highlights the solution. Obviously, there's no silver bullet solution, but we wanted to show some lessons from other countries, and we wanted to discuss what the government could be doing um, and what social media platforms could be doing and how they could be more responsible for the problem. So this is a short clip from the very beginning of episode three, which is the prescriptive chapter. It's time to fight back against disinformation. But these are the people leading the charge. Can you please explain to us the difference between a bot and a troll? Is Twitter the same as what you do? You can look at a lot of gray hair and realize that uh, my technology capabilities are very shallow. Not very encouraging, is it? 
But this isn't the first time the US government's been asleep at the wheel on this. Mr. Allen, how can we compete with this communist propaganda? You know now that Russia's been attacking the US like this since the 50s, but did you know that for the first 30 years of that, no one in the US government took it seriously? There was not a very high awareness of disinformation or active measures. So there was a, a tendency to want to keep the waters smooth. So people often ask me, um, like, you know, how did you become so interested in this even once you got the document? And I just want to quickly share two personal stories of how I became so obsessed with this issue. Um, this is uh, a photo of me and not a photo of me. About 10 years ago, I lived in Pakistan and I was a foreign correspondent there. And I was the victim of a disinformation campaign launched in Pakistan. I was accused of being one of the terrorists who uh, killed dozens of school kids in a school in Peshawar. The bottom left is a photo of the actual dead terrorist and the top photos are of me when I was reporting there. And the most famous national TV talk show host anchor made this uh, disinformation campaign. It's part of a much broader campaign where the country blames external factors like India and the US and Israel for its domestic problems. And my Twitter account blew up and I even to this day get messages from Pakistanis asking me why I committed these crimes. They also accuse me of being a CIA agent and uh, these are sort of mainstream beliefs there. And when I was living there, I didn't respond to any of these beliefs because I also believed what you just heard Kathleen Bailey say, which is that if you respond to a lie, you dignify it. And I think, you know, in the past few years, I have learned that you need to take these things on more aggressively and get in front of them and silence is not an appropriate solution. The other experience I had that, uh, sort of furthered my curiosity is I also used to live in Eastern Europe and some of you may know that these are the most advanced countries and societies in the world when it comes to fighting disinformation and critical thinking. They've been in Russia's shadow for centuries and they're used to this and there are some extraordinary efforts going on in Eastern Europe. In fact, the leaders of these countries have testified in Washington DC on how to fight disinformation. So uh, our film has an entire section on what uh, sort of the, the, the forefront soldiers on disinformation are doing in Eastern Europe. There's an old expression uh, during the Soviet Union, you may know the, news, the government propaganda newspaper Pravda, and the expression said that uh, if you want to read pra Pravda, you read what's between the lines, not the actual words. And you understand the truth by knowing what was not written. So here is a short clip about what was happening, what is happening in Eastern Europe. I also used to live in Eastern Europe. Estonia, Ukraine, they lag behind us in many things, but when it comes to fighting disinformation, there's so much we can learn from them. For instance, if uh, you turn on the TV in Latvia on a Sunday night, you'll see this. A primetime show all about Russian lies. In the same slot where we'd be watching American Idol, folks in Riga are tuning in to watch the latest disinformation be systematically described, debunked and destroyed. And it's not just Latvia. Ukraine has a bilingual stop fake news show broadcast by dozens of TV stations. Disinformation never stops and neither do we. Welcome to Stop Fake. The, the Czech government monitors disinformation as a form of terrorism. Lithuania has thousands of volunteer cyber warriors. They call them elves who relentlessly troll the Russian trolls. And in Estonia, there's a kind of digital national guard. Thousands of volunteers who, among other things, fight disinformation. The countries that have been exposed to this the longest are the best at dealing with it. They see things we don't see, they smell things we don't smell. Meanwhile, back here, we're just learning the hard way what happens when we don't fight back. The Pizzagate conspiracy, no journalist was going to actively debunk that because they didn't think that anybody truly believed that. We now know that they did, 
and actually it, it, it seems that we should have done more coverage during the election, that there was a rumour circulating and, and, it, and let's debunk it. So this is the prescription, right? Fact-checking, media literacy, engaged citizens rallying around good journalism to create a culture of critical thinking. Ah, who are we kidding? Media literacy is great and all, but we need something way stronger. And for that, we've got to talk about the responsibility of this guy. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. So episode three basically talks the audience through media literacy and civil society, uh, responsibility of the platforms, and eventually our government leaders um, and, and regulation. Um, so there are a handful of takeaways from this episode. Um, one is to look into to other countries for answers. You in Brazil are not at this alone, and there are uh, both frightening and hopeful examples around the world. Um, the Philippines and Turkey um, have been going through this even before the U.S., and uh, there's a lot of precedent, uh, both good and bad. One of my favorite examples, which is not in the film, just because it was very difficult to visualize, is in Slovakia. There's a private sector uh, initiative. It's a consortium of media buyers and ad agencies, and they refuse to buy ads on TV stations unless those TV stations do not broadcast disinformation. I think it's a really interesting example because it's the private sector and it has a financial incentive as opposed to just hoping people will have the values to be on the right side of history. One of the conclusions of our film is that there is no silver bullet and none of these solutions are singular, uh, but you know they add up together. Um, the other big takeaway is like we point to other examples around the world like Iran and Myanmar and Pakistan. These are, um, there's so much happening here in Brazil where you can draw parallels to other countries. And perhaps the more depressing takeaway is that one of the main differences uh, between the history and modern day is that back then it was us against them. It was the U.S. against the Soviet Union. And today it's us against us. And governments are now using this playbook to sow domestic discord on their own people. And we're seeing that all over the world right now in a more local level, even sometimes at a municipal level. Just three quick takeaways journalistically for our industry that we learn from this film. One is just the visual power to reach new audiences. I think by making a film with animation, we were able to reach people uh, who do not subscribe to the Times and do not read the Times, uh, which was one of our goals, is to make this accessible and digestible for ordinary people. The second thing is, and I think this is really important, especially uh, may ring true in Brazil, which is, you know, we're obsessed with the news. We're reading it all day, nonstop. And for ordinary, normal people, we should not assume that they're reading the paper every day and that they read yesterday's paper. And this, this film takes you 30,000 feet above the news. I would argue that this film is 100 front page stories bundled into 60 min 47 minutes. But it doesn't assume that you read those 100 stories. It assumes that you're playing with your kids and you're at the park and you're running and you're at the gym. It assumes that you have a life and it's trying to catch you up to speed. So it's explanatory journalism. And the last thing is, hopefully you can tell, but I just have a very firm belief that taking on a serious subject, one of the most important stories of our generation, with investigative and explanatory reporting, can be fun. And I think that oftentimes our big, serious series and packages feel like homework to ordinary audiences. And our goal was to make this something that will scare you and to share original reporting and to be truthful, but also to be delightful. And I think something can be delightful and investigative. And our tendency is always to make stories for us, what we want to write, what we want to tell, stories we want to make. But it's not about us. It's about making something that people can watch and share with other people who are not reading the paper. That is the biggest victory we can have in this echo chamber world that we live in. I just want to mention the global reach and impact. 
um, we sold the film to BBC World and it broadcast in 200 countries and it was really cool on the weekend that it was broadcasting, I was following it on Twitter and it was popping up both in Argentina, South America, and then some hours later in Kenya, and then some hours later in Asia and you could see different people responding to it in their languages and many people around the globe found it very relatable. We also looked at the completion rates and 60% of viewers are international. So we were reaching people who would never read the Times. Also, I found it fascinating that our highest completion rate was in Bosnia, which is a country that's arguably one of the most targeted countries right now of Russian disinformation. Uh, Russia's waging an aggressive disinformation campaign there and Bosnians watched 80% of the film. And lastly, uh, it's hard to see these, but um, this is a, a, a Facebook post by an editor who runs a prominent newspaper in Taiwan. And he wrote us and said, we're gonna be translating the subtitle, uh, your subtitles into Taiwanese because everything you describe is happening here and the Chinese are doing to us here in Taiwan. And our people need to understand this. This is the most heartwarming response we received. Um, it's a gentleman in Iran who lives in a small city, and he um, basically translated our, uh, most of our film into about 50 tweets with these screenshots. And I sent him a DM and asked him, why are you doing this? And he said, well, I live in a small city and we're having uh, factory protests here. Uh, we're, we're striking because of uh, pay wages. And the government, the local municipal government, is launching a disinformation campaign to get us off the streets. And everything that you outlined in your film is what's happening to us right now in our city among factory workers. And he said, the response I'm getting in Farsi in Iran is unbelievable because everyone is recognizing these uh, tactics and techniques, the playbook in Iran. So even at the local level, uh, it was resonating in a far-flung country. Uh, it's also being used in high schools in Romania and um, has appeared in uh, some museums and other places like that. So that's all I have prepared. Um, I think we're going to go to a Q&A now, and I look forward to your questions. Obrigado, Adam. Muito bom, muito bem. É, já temos muitas perguntas aqui, nosso tempo está... Estamos atrasados, então vou tentar ser o mais rápido possível. Já peço vênia ao presidente, cadê Daniel Bramati? Podemos atrasar 15 minutos aqui? 12. 12, tá bom. Tudo se negocia. Está funcionando? Eu vou falar em português para facilitar. Né? E... Bom... A primeira coisa que eu queria estabelecer, Adam, você é agente da CIA, não? No comment. <risos> Bom, é, acho que era importante você explicar por que, que essa, esses documentários foram publicados na sessão de opinião do New York Times e por, qual que é a diferença? Porque existe uma diferença de como as coisas funcionam nos Estados Unidos, especialmente no New York Times, e nos jornais brasileiros. Então, se você puder explicar como é que funciona esse procedimento. I think the answer is particular to the U.S. Uh, we, um, we have a very firm divide in our newsroom between newsroom and opinion. We're on different floors, and we report completely separately. And it's important to note that opinion journalism in the US um, is still fact-checked. It's still original reporting. Um, in fact, opinions that are rooted in, in fact make the argument more persuasive. So um, the standards are very similar, but we embrace uh, commentary and perspective. And about a year and a half ago, I started this new opinion video department. And the, the ideology of this department was that the medium of video is, uh, and is used most effectively when it's opinionated. No one goes to YouTube and thinks, I want voiceless, neutral, objective, sterile video. That would be really fun to watch. I mean, people want video with voice and personality and attitude and pomp and commentary and still have facts in it. So 
I would argue that this film is not overtly opinionated, mm -hmm. but the attitude and the use of voice is highly opinionated. Se vocês quiserem aumentar um pouco a luz para facilitar o trabalho dos nossos amigos fotógrafos, por favor. Tem várias perguntas uh, chegando. Eu peço perdão a quem está mandando, que eu não vou citar todos os nomes, mas vou tentar reunir porque o tempo é curto. Sobre quanto tempo demorou para fazer o documentário? Quantas pessoas estavam envolvidas? Qual o custo total que ele teve? Uma estimativa. Leave it to the journalist to get right into the money, huh? Exactly. You don't waste any time. No. Um, so, I mean, we made the film over a year and a half, but I run this department that's also making news video. So we, um, there were many months where the film was put to sleep because of our news cycle. Um, I, it was made with a co-director, Adam Westbrook, who was a freelance YouTuber incredibly talented editor, and uh, he was my co-director. I hired him, uh, basically I gave him a 30-page outline of my reporting, uh, organized by categories, and he turned it into cinema. Uh, we worked very closely together remotely. He's based in London. Um, there was a, a cinematographer, an associate producer. Um, I did the reporting, and there was um, a, a co-writer. I mean, it was basically a team of five people, Uh, working in a very spotty fashion, intermittently. And it's hard to calculate the cost because we, uh, we borrowed a lot of other resources from the department, which are super expensive to the outside world. Uh, but I would estimate it to be somewhere maybe around $50,000 to $75,000. E você também, usando, eu não vou fazer nenhuma pergunta aqui hoje, porque vocês me inundaram de perguntas, eu vou só reproduzir o que eu estou recebendo. É, você acha que há outras redações no mundo, e obviamente estão, as pessoas aqui estão se referindo às redações brasileiras, que eu não sei se você vai poder responder sobre elas, mas enfim, que fariam esse tipo de investimento para produzir um documentário como esse? Yeah, I mean, there are newsrooms all over the world that are making this. They're called TV stations. They just happen to be making formats that are still behind a desk and are sterile and inaccessible. And the average age of a TV viewer in the U.S. is 68 years old. And if they found out that we spent 50 to 75 grand, they would think that, um, you know, we've just made the cheapest, best film in the history of the world. I mean, they would spend that in a... Uh, in, a, in, le, le, in less than one episode of 60 Minutes. Um, so I think it's less, I don't, I don't think it's that interesting. I mean, I understand the budget might not be applicable to uh, every country in the world. Uh, we were, even we had to cheat and borrow funds to make this happen. Uh, but I think there are lessons in this that can apply to anyone making journalism, which is, um, you know, original reporting is the precious seed of any good project. Um, and you can cosmetically dress things up as much as you can, but if you don't have original reporting, you're going to have an empty tank. Muitas perguntas aqui de vários é, colegas que estão na audiência, na, na plateia, perguntando, bom, mas os Estados Unidos usaram essas mesmas técnicas de desinformação em outros países. Vocês até mencionam isso num pedaço que você não mostrou aqui no vídeo, é, mas eu queria que você falasse um pouco sobre isso. Até que ponto esse manual foi escrito apenas pelos soviéticos ou se a CIA não deu nenhuma colaboração? Mesmo você não sendo agente da CIA, claro. The US would never do anything like this. What are you talking about? You guys, your brains are polluted with disinformation. Um, no, there's actually a section in the film that deals with this issue. We, we, it's a persuasive argument. We, we bring up this argument. We even show some people talking about this argument. Uh, we argue that, yes, the U.S. has a long history. In fact, I always say that um, one of the reasons why the anti-American conspiracy is so effective in Pakistan is because the U.S. has been meddling in Pakistan since the country was founded in 1947. So again, there's a kernel of truth in that. Um, but we argue in the film that the scope, 
the scale and the investment of active measures in Soviet disinformation is completely um, exceeds anything that the US could have dreamed of. The professionalism and the fact that it was run through military intelligence um, is so much more effective and high-end and sophisticated. That doesn't justify what the US does. It's just these are the godfathers of disinformation. These are the masterminds. And when you have a relatively healthy democracy, even if it's a diminishing democracy, as The Economist just ranked us, um, you have checks and balances in your system. So I'll just give you a quick funny story. The US, and Claire, correct me if I have it wrong, but the US tried a, a dis, uh, you can call it a disinformation or an information campaign to win hearts and minds in the Muslim world, like to people who might convert to ISIS. And they made YouTube videos to target them. And the videos started with a sentence that said, the following message is brought to you by the US government, which is basically saying, the people you don't trust at all are about to change your mind. And they had to do that because of a checks and balance system in their rules and regulations about disclosing where the money is coming from. But it's totally absurd. And you can imagine someone in the Kremlin watching that and thinking, boy, you guys are amateurs. Em algum momento no filme, vocês falam, um dos espiões entrevistados fala que havia 15 mil agentes. Oh, sorry. Oh. My Portuguese is not that good. Em algum momento no filme, vocês falam que é, a KGB tinha 15 mil agentes envolvidos nesse tipo de operação e que todos os agentes da KGB eram obrigados a dar ideias de desinformação e eram é, avaliados pela quantidade e qualidade das é, ideias de, dos projetos de desinformação que eles apresentavam e que o Putin foi, inclusive, treinado e avaliado por essa escala. Você é, acha que isso ainda continua acontecendo? E, se, e existe, talvez, foi copiada essa fórmula por, por outros serviços de inteligência? Só um parênteses, no Brasil, inteligência militar é considerado um oxímoron, é uma, uma impossibilidade teórica. Então, eu não sei a resposta a essa pergunta. Eu não sou qualificado, nós não podemos, na verdade, aprender isso. E uma das perguntas que eu mais recebo é, você acha que esse playbook ou esse... Like this, uh, uh, these techniques are being sold um, to other governments. I spoke to someone in the US government that said that he's aware of other uh, governments uh, that are training governments in Africa underground as consultancy in disinformation. But uh, I didn't have any evidence of that. Um, it was an off the record conversation. But I actually don't think it matters. I don't think it matters um, like who's training who formally or informally. All that matters is that the playbook is uh, open source. It's in the public domain and everyone is using it around the world. So how they got it is like a pretty uninteresting thing to discuss. The question is, how do you counter it? Às vezes, talvez, talvez as próprias agências de comunicação parecem às vezes usar esse playbook. É, eu queria te perguntar sobre a reação que vocês tiveram ao, ao documentário, não apenas as reações positivas, mas principalmente as reações negativas. E você mencionou muito rapidamente no final que desistiu da política de ignorar as críticas e os ataques e, em algum momento, ser proativo para se livrar deles. Quando é que você toma essa decisão? Em que circunstância você res, é, resolve responder, revidar? I mean, I think the most valid criticism, which I agree with, is that um, the prescriptive solution is super, super complicated. For us, it was one episode, and you could make 10 episodes on the, it was sort, it's sort of a different film. And I wish we had the time and resources to go down that route, but fortunately, Frontline and other media have gone in that direction in the past six months. Um, I think like it's really tricky and you don't want to drown in responding to the nuance of every single allegation. 
Um, but I do think that silence is unacceptable. And when in those old reports, uh, there was a faction of people in the late 1970s in the government that wanted to speak out against all of these lies and they were told to remain silent. And it wasn't until Ronald Reagan took office that he demanded that everyone start taking this on aggressively. So I do think that there's a course correction happening now and um, we're societies that are under assault of disinformation are way more vocal than they were a few years ago. Um, I guess my main criticism, um, and Claire, you can chime in because you might disagree with me, but like, I think that journalists um, play a role in this, but I think we over inflate um, our uh, power and our responsibility. And I think that journalists are definitely part of the solution, but I also think that at the highest level, this is disinformation warfare. It's not disinformation, it's disinformation warfare. And it's a military and it's an intel response. And the countries that are countering this with the most success are doing it um, with you know, significant cyber tools and warfare and communication and um, a, a fact check is a lovely thing and I love a good fact check. And for you fact checkers out there, like keep up the good work. But I think that's underestimating the problem to sit up day and night talking about fact checks. E para um jornalista que está sob ataque como você ficou no Paquistão, acusado de ser um terrorista, qual é o momento em que você deve sair do silêncio obsequioso e partir para o ataque? So I don't know the right time, but I think one thing that journalists can do better is we can be more transparent about the inputs and standards of our reporting. So I think, at least in the States, um, institutions like the Times have a history of just letting their reporting speak for themselves. And if you have a reporter who speaks another language or has an expertise or has been covering a beat for their entire life, then you should disclose these things or your standards and your ethics if you don't accept money, the things that separate your organization um, and your standards from other places, we need to be far more public and transparent about those things because that's going to help gain trust over time. It doesn't happen quickly, but just publishing and hope, like we have all of these standards at the Times. They're, um, they're what make us great and we don't advertise them enough. We're doing it more and more and I just think journalists that um, that live by certain rules that are there for good reason, we should make them public and we should constantly be letting our audiences know why, of course, we all make mistakes and we'll continue to, but what are the things that separate us from some, you know, Oshkosh Bagash random website that is putting out disinformation? A gente, infelizmente, já estourou o estouro permitido, mas eu vou estourar mais três minutos. É, se você puder tentar sintetizar numa resposta. Everything can be late here. It's okay. I'll be here all day too. Yeah, okay. Me too. So. Cool. É... Boa. O presidente Sim? autorizou. So. É, você acha que não sei até que ponto você está familiarizado com a situação política no Brasil, mas, olhando o playbook que você organizou, eu, é muito fácil de identificar várias daquelas técnicas sendo uh, aplicadas aqui. O Brasil está no seu momento de maior polarização política nos últimos 50 anos, provavelmente, até. E isso levou às consequências que nós estamos vivendo hoje do ponto de vista governamental. Uh, você acha que é, sempre há uma ação externa, no caso dos Estados Unidos da Rússia, ou isso já virou um lugar comum na comunicação, principalmente depois da popularização das mídias sociais, no caso do Brasil, especialmente do WhatsApp, e virou meio que o lugar comum da contra-informação e da desinformação? Um... Sorry, uh, the, 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 has it become commonplace? But what is, is the it? Is, exactly. What, oh, has what become I, commonplace? Você acha que é necessário que haja sempre uma conspiração por trás ou já virou uma coisa tão popular 
que qualquer campanha política eleitoral de fundo de quintal já é capaz de aplicar as mesmas técnicas com sucesso, dada a facilidade de acesso às plataformas como as mídias sociais de chegar no público. I mean, I think one of the most important takeaways is that it's not like um, it, there are no specific consistent victims of this. And if you study these campaigns, they go against the left and against the right. They go on Zappy Zappy and they go on platforms that you've never heard of in China and Iran and other places. So the, the platforms change country to country. And there's, I think, in mainstream media, in a lot of democracies or emergent democracies, there's an impression that they're limited to sort of right-wing or populist uh, factions of government, and they're not. I mean, even the Russian campaign in 2016 targeted Jill Stein, who was our far leftist candidate. Um, so, I mean, it was still with the same end goal uh, to favor Trump, but um, I think that, like, it is our responsibility as journalists to be, we've, we always need to be responsible, but more diligent and almost paranoid um, and reporting with absolute fear all the time because we now live in a climate, in an era where there's no room for error. Para finalizar, uh, a gente está se vendo cada vez mais com um problema e uma vantagem, que são os vazamentos. A gente recebe cada vez mais informações de fontes anônimas, insiders, enfim, e cada vez mais difícil, talvez, de checar a veracidade dessas informações. O New York Times já se viu em algumas situações com o Wikileaks ou com o ICIJ, em que ele precisou lidar com esse tipo de base de dados gigantesca que foi vazada. Como você acha que deve ser o procedimento para evitar cair até numa operação de desinformação através de um vazamento desse tipo? So I saw the news story just uh, a couple days ago when I was here about Glenn Greenwald testifying and I guess some politician came up to him afterwards or maybe when he was on the stand and said uh, what like why do you only release some documents? And he said, okay, if you want, I'll release all. I don't know if the translation is completely accurate, but um, it's a catch-22, as you point out. And um, my answer may be simplistic, but it's that, yes, it is hard, and that's, that's what reporting is. And if you can't confirm and vet something properly, then you don't publish it. And we've tried to show enormous constraint when there are questions. We had some really, um, I know it's not from WikiLeaks, but we had some really juicy uh, you know, bits of information in this film that we didn't put in the film because we just weren't confirming them. And that's what happens to our White House reporters every day, and that's what happens when you have these organizations that are concealing the hand of other sources, like WikiLeaks and others. And I think these, um, old age principles of journalism, which is if you can't vet and verify, don't publish, should hold true. And if anyone is under the impression that it's easy, then they're mistaken. Ou seja, se você recebe uma grande quantidade de informações e só consegue verificar uma parte delas, você só deve publicar aquilo que você consegue verificar e não a base como um todo. Bom, queria agradecer muito a vocês e ao Adam, a gente já estourou muito o nosso tempo. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Até a próxima. Thank you very much. It was yeah. great, really great. Sorry, I went a little long. No, no, but uh, sorry because of the we delayed the. Yeah.